The conflict in Sudan's Darfur region began in 2003 and has left 300,000 people dead, according to United Nations estimates. Some 250,000 refugees from the fighting have made their way across Sudan's western border into the neighboring country of Chad, where they're housed in 12 refugee camps. Freelance journalist David Axe traveled to eastern Chad earlier this summer, where he visited one of these camps. I went to Chad to, to try to understand the uh, growing security and humanitarian crisis in Central Africa. Most people would know that as the Darfur crisis, but in reality it's a, it's a problem that spreads across um, at least three countries. The fighting in Darfur essentially pits the, the government of Sudan, uh, which is an, an Arab-dominated dom government, versus disenfranchised African tribes in the western province of, of Darfur. So for about five years we've had um, sort of a intensifying um, guerrilla warfare uh, that has sprawled over the border with, with Chad and uh, had a knock-on effect um, in Central African Republic. When fighting started in Darfur around 2003, many of the African tribes people who um, in the beginning were, were accurately characterized as victims of, of the Darfur crisis fled into Chad. There are around a dozen major refugee camps in, in Chad, uh, most of them in the east along the border with Darfur. Uh, housing Darfuri refugees. There are also several major camps in the south for Central African Republic uh, refugees. To a great extent, uh, Chad and Darfur are aid economies. There's not a lot of natural resources in Chad with the exception of some oil fields in the south. So a lot of the, the economic activity hinges on the presence of aid groups. There are thousands of aid workers representing dozens of groups, most of them Europeans and North Americans. They do have many local workers too. The refugee camps are administered by the UN High Commission for Refugees. The food distribution is administered by the World Food Program. But the day-to-day the -day management of camps in the east of Chad, uh, along the border with Darfur, falls to a particular aid group. In other words, the UN has sort of subcontracted with an aid with one aid group per camp to do the day-to-day -day work in the camp. One of the biggest aid groups in Chad is Care International, which uh, has its major offices in Canada and the U and the US. Uh, and Care manages the Iridimi camp. Uh, that means that every day Care workers living in a compound uh, near the camp, take a convoy escorted by Chadian gendarmes, Chadian military police basically. They take a convoy into the camp, they work during the morning, take a short break in the afternoon, work a couple more hours before nightfall, they're back in their compound. Or aid groups, care included, don't have a 24-hour presence in the refugee camps. They, they have a daily presence, uh, but the camps aren't, aren't safe. For, for foreign workers, or even for, for native workers of aid groups. They aren't safe for them at night. How many refugees in your camp? 18,622 refugees are in Egdemi camp. How many men with you? Ten men. We have 50 blocks. Each uh, person has uh, ten blocks to supervise. How many families? Since you have one family per ten. We have around 5,000 families, I think. I would say 5,200. Oh, I'm told 4,973. And generally speaking, how many people in each family? 
Well, that depends. Sometimes you'll find in one family four people, uh, other families have ten people, sometimes the family is just one. It all depends. What are the biggest problems you're facing? Well, as you know, we have opened that camp in March 04, and uh, we have only had one tent distribution. The tents are worn out, they are torn, the people are really ill housed under these tents. We should replace them. We haven't had any new ones. What else? Well, education. We have a problem with education, as you know. There are no qualified teachers in the camp, so we can't really teach. Same with health. Uh, nobody is uh, really giving health care. There's no qualified nurses, for instance. We don't know about MSF. One day uh, they left. They upped and left. So now it's refugees that are not qualified that are manning the health uh, post. But they are not nurses or doctors. They are not professionals. So right now we are suffering from that. Do you keep receiving new refugees here? Yes. There are many, many refugees coming. But I think the HCR is perhaps going to send nurses and doctors. We talked about that yesterday in a coordination meeting. I think they're going to send one doctor and one nurse per camp. What about security? Oh, well, security. I think uh, the camp is calm right now. There are no incidents. We haven't heard anything. Except perhaps that uh, some strange people are coming in. Unidentified people are coming inside the camp with military vehicles. Sometimes they wear turbans also. Because Chad has this long history of first being colonized by France and now having this sort of close close economic ties, close cultural ties, linguistic ties. It's, the country is more amenable to foreign presence than Sudan is, for, for example. So uh, Chad has become the major base for the international effort to, to, to save Darfur, to save Central Africa. I had described Darfur as a facet of a regional crisis. What you have in Central Africa is a lack of resources, especially water, wood, and food, and rebellions against tribal dominated governments where the current regimes favor uh, either one tribe or one section of a tribe over everyone else in the country. The various rebel groups operating in Chad, in Sudan, and also in Central African Republic use neighboring countries as bases of operations, which is how this is uh, a regional problem, vice just a, a problem in, in one particular country, and the problems are only getting worse as resources dwindle. If you visit uh, a Chadian refugee camp out in the east on any given day, uh, you'll see mostly women. Um, it's not that these women don't have husbands, they do. The husbands are out. The explanation you get, it depends on who you ask and when you ask, and the, the, the answer might change from one minute to the next. They say their men are out herding um, uh, or out working in, and they'll even say, my, my, my husband is out working in Darfur. He went across the border to work today. Um, but we know that many of those men are fighting in Darfur, and they'll periodically return to the camp to rest and to see their families. Uh, and there's not a whole lot that anyone can do uh, to stop that. The flow of, of, of people in and out of the camps and across the border uh, between Chad and, and, and Sudan um, has brought Darfur's problems into Chad. Uh, so you do see, you, we have seen attacks on Chadian soil 
um, by the Sudanese government, air attacks especially. We've seen attacks on Sudanese soil by Chadian-based rebels. Um, there's a similar situation along the border with Central African Republic. So what you're seeing over time is these borders sort of blurring and conflicts merging um, into one Central African civil war. It's hard to find a refugee family in the camps in eastern Chad that hasn't lost somebody um, in, in Darfur or in Chad even. And no, not, not everyone is willing to talk about that. Uh, as a journalist visiting, well, in my case, Iridimi, CARES camp in eastern Chad, there was an understanding that, that I, I would not raise issues that might cause distress. Yes, the story is important and I needed to get it, but you've got to be careful, you've got to be diplomatic. Some families are more willing to talk than others. Some you can tell just by looking at them and everyone knows they're so traumatized that they, no, they won't talk. There are certain subjects even approached diplomatically. There are certain subjects that are just off limits. You're discouraged from asking where husbands are and what they're doing and the reason is that many of them are fighting in Darfur. You're discouraged from asking overtly about the rebel presence in the camps, although it's the UN will acknowledge it, it it's there. Asking about the recruitment of child soldiers is a big no-no. And it's not that there aren't refugees in these camps who recognize these things as problems, of course they do, but even those who wish they could speak out can't uh, because at night the aid groups leave and the camps basically manage themselves. And if anybody is breaching a trust that the majority of the population understands um, they could be hurt or killed for speaking out. Ask her how long she's been here. She's been here five years. Five years. Several men and uh, children died. Two of the children died. How did they die? What did they die of? Oh, during the uh, aerial bombing. The villages were bombed. The Janjaweed bombed the village, and that's when her kids died. It's, they were bombed by the uh, Sudanese government, actually. Do they still have uh, relatives in Sudan? Yeah, very few are left. Mm. Very few uh, survived the bombing in the village. Are you in touch with them? She doesn't have any news. Sometimes they can call them early in the morning or in the evening. Would she like to go back home to a village? Yes, she'd like to go home. Why can't she go home? It is not safe enough. You can't go to that village anymore for the time being. How many members of a family are here? Twelve. They are a family of twelve members here in the camp. Yeah, how old is she? Uh, uh, 
She's 45 years old. And she looks very young. Tell her that she looks younger than 45. How many children? She's got five children. Where is her husband? He left uh, to work. No, he's going to help with the uh, nursery and the gardens. So he leaves every morning and he comes back in the evening, yes. He has to work in the camp. Ask her what she's doing every day. How does she spend her days? She doesn't have any work. Her husband works. And otherwise the organizations feed them. What does the husband do exactly? He doesn't have a regular job, but he helps with uh, growing plants and food. And uh, he does the kind of work that people ask him to do. She said she doesn't know exactly what he does. But he comes back every evening. Yes, he does. Does she have enough water? They have uh, animals to feed also and the organization is taking care of it. But she's left all her animals in the Sudan. And here she has nothing. Does she have enough water? No, nobody has enough water. So what do you do if you don't have enough water? They go in the village next door and ask for water. They ask the locals to help them with water. When the children are sick, what do you do? She said she goes to the hospital. But she wouldn't know where to go today because you can't leave the zone. So you have to deal with the uh, camp uh, people. The other ones are going to take care of the children. Where does she find her food every day? The uh, WFP distributes uh, the food every, every morning, the World Food Program. Is that all? She needs soap, she needs salt. And there's very little water for each also. Even the food is not enough for all of them. 
We can ask about security too. So uh, we were saying, is she safe here? Is, uh, is there security in this camp? No, security is very deficient. Even within the camp, within the different zones of the camp, we have uh, uh, like a neighborhood watch, we, we ourselves uh, have to stand guard. Amada does. Amada. Once you get close to the, the border with Darfur, uh, on, the, on the eastern side of Chad, the biggest population centers are refugee camps, larger even than, you know, villages that have been around for decades or centuries. Because of the massive and growing population of refugees in Chad, Darfuri refugees for the most part, uh, there's increasing tension between refugee communities and local residents. There simply isn't enough water, there isn't enough land, there isn't enough food, there isn't enough of anything to go around. One of the major roles of aid groups in eastern Chad is not just providing material, but then mediating the conflicts that result from the inequalities that result from an aid effort devoted to refugees that, for the most part, neglects local residents. The UN recently has adopted a strategy of giving aid to Chadians, to, to establish Chadians, not, not refugees, but Chadian natives, in the communities around refugee camps, in addition to giving aid to the refugees, which raises some important questions, but is attempting to, to head off what could be another chapter of the civil wars in, in, in Central Africa, that is fighting between refugees and, and native populations. Uh, you especially see it in the case of Iridimi, uh, the Iridimi ref refugee camp uh, managed by CARE, uh, fights over water. Within the camps, there are wells. Care, care digs wells, but um, the groundwater, the, the water table sinking as a result of all these new wells, and um, the best wells are outside the camp, the wells that have been there for, for years. So uh, the refugees have no choice but to, to go outside the camp for, for much of their water need, uh, and they run headlong into local residents. When I saw it, it looked like barely controlled chaos. And I was told by care aid workers that this actually was progress. But the underlying problem, that is the lack of water resources, is not going away. In fact, it's getting worse. Very often we are talking about uh, conflicts between the locals and the refugees in refugee camps. But usually they are fighting around natural resources, just like what we have seen this morning. They are fighting for water. They are fighting for land as well. And also the refugees go out of the camp with their cattle to graze. And this really bothers the locals who also have animals. And around the uh, water points, for instance, the refugees come to drink, to take their water, and they uh, go into the wells. The locals also are using these wells. When the two communities meet at the well, they fight and sometimes people die. Fortunately, for the last couple of months, we have created a joint committee in the camp and in the village. So these two communities now work together. They collaborate, especially the Chadian chiefs and the head of the refugees. They get together 
and they are trying to settle the problem. For instance, if we have a problem somewhere, these two uh, groups meet and they try to see how we can solve the problem. The American presence in, in Chad is sort of behind the scenes, but it's a key role because American donors, both the U.S. government via the State Department and USAID and American private donors account for the biggest source of aid donations to Chad. The numbers are hard to come by because nobody tracks all of the private donors, but the uh, State Department has contributed six hundred million dollars in the past couple years that doesn't count other agencies that have have chipped in and all told foreign aid to Chad has been valued in the past five years at two or three billion dollars probably around half of which is American money so without US funding uh, the humanitarian crisis would be completely unmanageable there is uh, humanitarian work going on in Darfur. There are camps, there are aid workers, but Chad is a much, well, it's not safe, but it's safer than Darfur. And Western countries' rela diplomatic relations with Chad are better than with Sudan. So Chad is sort of the, the preferred base for aid groups and for international efforts to address Central Africa's problems. In other words, to address Darfur, which makes sense also because so many of the Darfuri refugees are in Chad. The prospects for people returning to Darfur from the refugee camps are nil right now. The UN says it openly that this crisis is still developing, the fighting has not stopped, uh, the security is not really getting better, the underlying causes of the conflict, there's been no movement on political solutions to these problems. And when it comes to resources, solutions are essentially impossible. You can't make more water come to Chad. Chad is dry. Chad is going to stay dry. And as Chad's population grows, water is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. So the UN right now and aid groups are focused on taking care of the refugees they've got with an eye towards long-term care and, where possible, towards integrating refugees into, into Chad on a permanent basis or a semi-permanent basis. So. No, there's no prospect of these refugees going home anytime soon. If anything, more refugees are coming. If you have comments or questions about C-SPAN's international programming, please email us at international at cspan.org. And you can watch this or other C-SPAN programming on the Darfur conflict by visiting our website. Just type the word Darfur into the search box in the upper right-hand corner of our homepage. That's at cspan.org.